Yep. Yep, and the hospital too. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds uh, program. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record and uh, also uh, please remember to fill out the program evaluation and if you could give us some ideas in regards to future topics and future speakers, the CME committee would be appreciative. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Lance Van Gundy. Uh, Dr. Van Gundy attended medical school at the University of Iowa, did his family practice residency at North Iowa Mercy and he's the medical director of the emergency department at Marshalltown Medical and Surgical Center. Uh, he is here today to do, discuss the management of acute low back pain and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Van Gundy. Thanks, Steve. Hi, folks. Uh, it's an impressive auditorium you've got here. I appreciate the chance to come and speak before you. Uh, this uh, initially seemed like sort of a mundane topic to talk about, um, but it uh, maybe is sort of near and dear to my heart. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to give you a little introduction why. Uh, back in uh, the uh, early experience of my practice, I've been in Marshalltown since 1998. Uh, there was a gentleman that we'll just call John Doe who uh, presented several times to the ER over the course of a couple of years with a variety of somatic complaints. Um, these included on one occasion a rash, on another occasion second degree burns, on a couple of occasions, different types of back pain, abdominal pain, shoulder pain, and as you can see here, uh, uh, two visits for urological issues, one of which prompted a transfer to Iowa City for nephritis. And in the fall of 2002, he unfortunately woke with a severe acute occurrence of pain and paraplegia, which was abrupt uh, without trauma, and he was discovered through subsequent workout to have uh, metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, near the end of his life and after, uh, his estate um, sought litigation, naming myself and uh, our partners, Dave Thomas, and uh, at that time, Dr. Eric Stenberg, as well as the clinic in Marshalltown Hospital as co-defendants. And um, this was an eight-year litigation. Um, we won summary judgment on a couple occasions, but the plaintiff kept appealing, and finally we um, were acquitted at the end and he couldn't take it any further. And, um, but what was interesting to me as the case went on was that uh, Dr. Thomas was appropriately dismissed as he never actually saw the patient, a, a PA under his supervision who actually did a very admirable job, <laughs> saw the uh, patient. So Dr. Thomas was dismissed uh, 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 noon on the day before the jury was going to go. Uh, and I was dismissed uh, maybe at one o'clock on the day before the jury was gonna go. And they kept Dr. Stenberg and uh, everybody else uh, on and sent the jury who then acquitted us or found us wholly exonerated. And what was interesting to me was why did they, um, you know, what was it, oops, about that, that, uh, <laughs> a little technical difficulty here, I bet it's, you know, what was it that, uh, led them to dismiss me from the case. And at the time, the only thing we could latch on to was that the plaintiff's expert witness thought that uh, Dr. Stenberg lacked adequate description of a sensory exam. And that has always st stuck in the back of my mind. And Dave and I sort of joke, Dave Thomas and I, behind uh, closed doors that we always include a sensory exam whenever we're looking at anybody with anything in the back or the lower <laughs> extremities now. And, um, and we had two other recent cases come through. I do our quality assurance reviews for the ER as the medical director there. And I just felt like uh, these two cases were slightly different but pertained to acute low back pain. They were interesting to me because I, I thought the care could have been more efficient for the patient uh, and certainly maybe um, left us in a slight position of uh, medical legal risk that we could have improved upon with our documentation and exam. And so when the, when the third case came around, I, I kicked this case over to Judy McCollum's office and risk management and Steve Hallberg with CME and I thought that would sort of be the end of it and uh, maybe there would be some education brought up and I sort of felt like this uh, general here who uh, wanted to know how deep the water was and his men kicked him in. So Steve uh, called me about it or sent me an email about a month later and said, well, since that's so interesting to you, why don't you come and talk to us about it? And so here we are. Um, and so uh, I, I felt like uh, this was maybe a good opportunity to see a problem and talk about it, uh, formalize it. It's a problem that we, uh, anybody in primary care deals with quite frequently and maybe we can identify some of the, uh, the warning signs of high risk factors for low back pain, particularly the acute presentation of low back pain. Uh, 
and maybe review, uh, you know, a standard exam of things that we need to keep in mind, not only for the patient's sake to be thorough, uh, but for our medical legal risk and our uh, document keeping. What we'll do today is talk briefly about the epidemiology of the presentation of acute low back pain. Uh, we'll use the uh, criteria that are set forth by the uh, uh, ARHQ, uh, which uh, we'll review in a little bit, uh, kind of to frame the discussion, uh, talking about three different categories of low back pain. I'd like to review the basic uh, tenets that I think will take us back to our first and second years of med school, reviewing some just obvious but very basic steps that we all need to re be reminded about. Uh, when we're looking at uh, low back pain, we'll talk about some red flags and maybe a comprehensive approach to dealing with this issue, and then, of course, some interesting case reviews at the end if we have time. So when we look at the, uh, the epidemiology of low back pain, uh, referenced already, it's pretty common. Um, a definition, according again to the AHRQ there, is uh, pain between the uh, flank region and the gluteal folds, but of less than 6 to 12 weeks duration, so that's a pretty in a wide variety of uh, uh, cases, and you'll see as we talk about different examples, there really is a wide variety of diseases that can present as acute low back pain. It is ranked the sixth most common uh, reason to visit the emergency room, and 17.8% uh, prevalence according to their data, uh, peak prevalence there between ages 45 and 60. But at some point in time, 80% uh, of adults will seek evaluation for some type of acute low back pain. Uh, it's related to a third of all disability costs in the U.S., and it's, again, so prevalent that the uh, AHRQ there actually has uh, on their website guidelines that you can access uh, that uh, detail how to uh, evaluate, manage, and their suggestions for treating uh, this problem. So with that in mind, uh, they, d they divide up acute low back pain into three broad categories. There's nonspecific back symptoms, which are largely the strains and that we commonly see that are short-lived and have to do with uh, simple but not dangerous mechanical issues, uh, sciatica, which they uh, encompass a lot of things in there, and then potentially serious spinal conditions. Um, uh, we'll reference uh, several examples. We'll start with the uh, nonspecific back symptoms. Um, the uh, great majority of the cases that we'll see in family practice and internal medicine clinics and the ER, thankfully, are related to this category. Um, you know, short-lived pain that's due to um, simple mechanical issues, uh, strains. Uh, these tip patients then typically lack radicular or nerve root presentation symptoms. Rarely do they have pain below the mid-thigh, for instance. And they tend to improve with conservative therapy, such as uh, anti-inflammatories, muscle relaxers, um, and physical therapy, and if needed, reevaluation. Um, these can arise from injury or inflammation of the disc, the annulus, muscle fibers, or facet joints, but we're not really talking per se about disc rupture and uh, nerve impingement yet with this category. Um, and uh, sciatica then is a, another different broad category that we'll get into a little bit. Uh, refers really to any pain uh, that is radicular in nature, sort of between uh, the nerve roots that the sciatic nerve um, uh, innervates, and so you can have gluteal pain, posterior thigh pain, lateral ankle pain, uh, typically as a, a radiation of pain or burning that originates in the back and travels down the leg. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, here's our dermatomal map, and you know the nerve roots of L4 to roughly S3, we come and look here, are going to give us you know pain that travels along the posterior lateral thigh, uh, down around the lateral malleolus uh, here. And so that's a classic, as an example, sciatic distribution of discomfort. Uh, and we would expect to see uh, some form of that in patients that are having inflammation of the sciatic nerve. Uh, go back to our anatomy. Just as a reminder, the sciatic nerve is comprised of the ventral rami of L4 through S3. And depending on what part of those nerve roots are pinched, you may get slightly different presentations of sciatic discomfort. As an example, the classic herniation posteriorly between L5 S1 causes pain in the posterior thigh and lateral leg. Um, a different example of sciatica occurs typically in athletes who are cyclists or runners. Uh, they've uh, lost some of their uh, strength out here on the lateral leg on this model, and so to accommodate for that, their piriformis muscle uh, becomes almost hypertrophic and uh, ends up pinching the sciatic nerve where it exits. So this uh, is also a painful uh, injury to athletes, if you will, or phenomenon to athletes. It's treated completely different, uh, but this is a form of sciatica that would improve usually with physical therapy to strengthen the uh, lateral hip adductors as well as anti-inflammatories 
uh, maybe even a consideration for a steroid shot with the appropriate uh, specialist. But uh, I point that out is uh, to, just to indicate that some forms of sciatica have nothing to do with the disc space or degenerative arthritis in the back. It's uh, kind of a nice model to remind ourselves of that etiology. And again, most common in athletes like runners and cyclists. Um, next, under the uh, AHRQ, they talk about potentially serious forms of pathology that can cause low back pain. And these get into some of the more uh, interesting things like Caudoquina syndrome, aneurysms and intra-abdominal pathology like pancreatitis, uh, fractures, of course, whether it's compression fractures or a more traumatic nature, infection, malignancy, and secondary causes. And we'll get a little bit more into these uh, examples here. So as a refresher, uh, you know, the caudoquina refers to the, those nerve fibers that descend below the area of the conus medullaris down here. And uh, anything that uh, impinges on those would be likely to cause things like incontinence, uh, weak anal sphincter tone, uh, a region of saddle anesthesia, which is basically anesthesia or, or around the pyorectal area. Uh, leg weakness, though, is very common with this uh, when it becomes uh, an emergent problem. Uh, and it uh, can be caused from a variety of things, central disc protrusion, uh, tumor malignancy, and spinal stenosis are some of the things that we'll see that uh, may lead to that. <clears throat> this has a, you know, is a pretty debilitating thing if we miss it. If somebody has gone from being able to walk independently and having normal toileting habits, and we miss this, and now they walk with a significant uh, uh, weak gait, maybe some foot drop, and they are uh, incontinent of urine and stool, you can imagine how that's going to make somebody angry. So I think it's important as we go on to keep these kind of diagnoses in the back of our mind. These are things you want to rule out, and you can do that pretty simply with some exam findings that we'll get to later. Uh, things pr that document your uh, motor and sensory exam effectively rule out the risk of cauda equina syndrome. On the other hand, if you think you're seeing this, uh, of course, you'd want to act uh, urgently to get that patient some help. Uh, same thing, of course, can be said for the next several things in this category. Uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms uh, are sometimes the bane of the ER doctor. This uh, diagnosis always scares me. The uh, last two cases of this I had were in uh, younger 50-year-old fellas that I just thought absolutely for sure had kidney stones. Pain was out to the side. They kind of came in doing the kidney stone restless dance. It was an abrupt onset of pain. Their vitals were fine. Uh, one fellow even had a history of kidney stones, and it felt that way. And we sort of got lucky and found it on CT looking for the kidney stone. And so uh, AAA can have a variety of presentations. It's not always the uh, patient who has the uh, ashen appearance with, high, with hypotension and, and tearing abdominal pain that radiates into the back. And sometimes we just have to remind ourselves that not all of our patients fit into that box or model that we were taught in medical school. And I uh, think this is a, a great example of that. This pain does tend to be unrelenting. In its early phases, when it's dissecting, patients with AAA tend not to have pain with movement, in my experience. Once it's ruptured, then they tend to develop really pretty pr prominent abdominal findings and hypotension. But in the early phases, when you can maybe help them, they're not going to have that stuff. Um, and so you'll need to keep that in mind as we move forward. Here's a, just a CT example. This is off the internet. I, this is not a patient I personally took care of. Obviously, a dilated aorta has ruptured out here with some uh, blood products out into the right side of the belly. And uh, ultrasound uh, is probably a faster way to pick this up uh, in the ER setting, but CT with or without contrast is usually pretty adept at ruling in or out this finding right away, and uh, then you can go from there. Uh, compression fractures uh, can happen in a variety of scenarios. This is another uh, diagnosis that the AARHQ throws into their more serious pathology because of its risk of disability. Uh, uh, if you have a younger patient with a fall, uh, and it doesn't have to be from a fall of great height, uh, three or four feet and landing on the buttocks with abrupt back pain, those patients uh, uh, probably merit an exam just because of the mechanism of injury where they're transmitting all those forces through the axial spine could certainly cause a compression fracture. The last one I had was a 28-year-old gal who just fell off a horse, was a little buck, and she landed off the horse right on her rump and had two compression fractures. And that were, of course, really painful to her, but they were picked up very easily on plain film. In our older population, it really takes, as you all probably very well know, minimal injury to induce a compression fracture. Uh, I think uh, anybody who's probably in their 40s and does primary care has seen some elderly patient we had a surprising lack of traumatic um, mechanism, such as sitting down maybe forcefully onto a, a chair or a couch, 
and then all of a sudden having severe mid thoracic or low back pain and lo and behold they've got a new compression fracture because of the nature of their osteoporosis uh, the other of course high risk factors for that are, are folks who have uh, long-term steroid use you don't always need uh, an MR to pick up on the uh, compression fracture. This just made a nice picture. Most of the time, plain film radiographs are going to identify that problem for you. But the key thing uh, with those is if you can compare it to, of course, older films and see is this new, is this a chronic problem, is it old, I think that helps your continuity of care identify uh, the lumbar uh, uh, and thoracic compression fractures. Moving on then, infection is, of course, can be a devastating cause of a serious cause of acute mid and low back pain. Uh, we're talking about epidural abscesses, discitis, uh, peridural abscesses. Uh, these, uh, uh, in our population, uh, coordinated through our fantastic uh, nephrology department, the few cases of this I've seen, uh, either the patient was uh, immune compromised for some other disease process, or they, uh, we have to think of it in our folks that have chronic central lines, like our dialysis patients. Uh, we've had a couple cases in the last five years that I just, uh, didn't think of this diagnosis right away uh, until, uh, you know, consultation with our specialist uh, here in Ames said, boy, you got to consider that with these folks. Uh, not only are they immune compromised, but they have a, uh, an access point for bacteria to get in with their central lines. Obvious other causes or risks for this would be IV drug use, any spine surgery within a year. Uh, should make you more suspicious of the possibility of this diagnosis and then again immune suppression of of all forms and types. We're going to review a case of this later that sort of puts a, um, a face on this uh, diagnosis. Uh, what's interesting is uh, this uh, diagnosis can have a fever, but sometimes doesn't. Uh, might have a normal CBC, but just elevated sed rate and CRP markers. So if you're not having a high index of suspicion to look for this, it can initially be a bit evasive. So when you take all, you know, if you shuffle all these things together and uh, the patient walks in the door, you know, how do we start to tease these apart and differentiate the diagnosis of acute low back pain? The differential is enormous. Uh, and particularly when you know that the grand majority of these are going to be self-limited issues. And what we want to do is identify those high-risk patients uh, and uh, take good care of them, but also protect ourselves medical legally. Well, I think it has to go back to history. You've just got to get back to taking a diligent, thorough history and starting at the basics. <clears throat> I'm always... Uh, um, astounded when I do quality reviews uh, how if we miss something if we just would have asked one or two a little more historical elements the the doctor or the PA would have been pointed in the right direction and uh, I think there are ways to ask a directed history that don't belabor uh, a 15 minute clinic visit or a, an ER visit and yet get right to the point and, and chisel off some of the high risk things we'll talk a little bit about some of those historical elements next uh, we will also review I think a basic exam then to rule in and out some of these more dangerous findings. <clears throat> and then uh, um, we'll talk about some of the red flag markers that should raise your um, eye of suspicion for some of the high risk cases. So th that's the order we'll go in now with the rest of the talk. So when we talk about historical elements, uh, you know, it's, an, it's important to know is this a recurrent thing that they've had that flares up twice a year with this routine activity? Have they had uh, previous surgery? Is it their first episode of back pain? I think that's significant. Uh, what's the timing of the pain? Uh, a lot of our rheumatological illnesses, uh, whether they're in the back or other joints, always, as you know, warm up and get better as the body moves on. And so ankylosing spondylitis is a great example of something that's worse in the morning and, uh, you know, better as the day goes on. Uh, contrasted to, say, uh, degenerative joint changes, which get sometimes worse with activity and are better with rest. Uh, ask specifically what are the alleviating and aggravating factors it seems like a silly cheesy question to ask but you know come right out and say what makes it better what makes it worse a lot of times patients will have keen insight into that um, on the other hand things that occur abruptly like kidney stones and AAA they, they can't really identify anything they just sort of come in really uncomfortable doing the what we call in, in RER the kidney stone dance um, and does the pain radiate uh, does it travel and if it does, does it travel to the anterior thigh, which might make you think up a little higher around the L12 area? Does it travel in a sciatic distribution or not? Um, we all have to wrestle with uh, malingering patients. Uh, and and uh, in the ER, we probably deal with uh, people uh, that are narcotic abusers a little more often than we'd like to. And uh, sometimes they'll give you a really bizarre radiation of pain that makes no ridiculous sense at all. <clears throat> and so to document that, I think, helps you kind of ferret out um, people that are maybe a little more high risk uh, 
than those that are not. Other historical elements to take into consideration, <clears throat> are they over 50 or under 20? You know, take their age in mind. Is there any history of trauma to explain a mechanical course? Any history of fever or weight loss? Is there any reason to suspect they might be immune compromised? Uh, I think these things start to shape and flavor your differential right away. And um, um, another course element is your past medical history. We've sort of referenced this already. Uh, and it, what's their uh, immune status? Is there a reason to suspect that there'd be an infectious etiology? Uh, they've been on steroids for a while, uh, yeah, such that you'd suspect an atypical uh, pathological compression fracture. They had back surgery within a year, et cetera, et cetera. These are all, uh, I know we're hitting these again, but I think uh, reviewing just the simple uh, basic stuff gets us um, uh, an ability to identify uh, the cases that we need to pay more attention to versus the garden variety low back pains that are going to get better with conservative treatment. When we talk about exam, it seems like people gloss over the fever right away. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's got to be significant. If you have somebody coming in with uh, more uh, indolent uh, history, uh, not just an abrupt uh, injury, but maybe they've got a little bit of reason to be immune compromised and a temp of about 101 and this back pain that's been lingering for several weeks, you know, you may be triggered to think more about an infectious etiology and go looking for that. But if you totally miss the fever or just sort of gloss over that in your vitals, um, that, that diagnosis may not come to the front of your mind. Uh, pay attention to the blood pressure, chronic hypertension, or abrupt hypotension in the setting of severe back pain could lead you to think about a triple A. So just cursory reminder of those. And after that, we got to get back to our exam basics. And in our ER, uh, it uh, makes me frustrated, but sometimes it's just better to, better to giggle uh, how often the nurses will room a patient uh, for a knee injury or a back injury, and they don't have the patient exposed. Or I love it when a uh, back injured patient comes in, and I walk into the room to see them, and they're still sitting in their coat and their clothes in the wheelchair. You know, we got to get these folks exposed. You need to look at their back. And so um, we're, we're doing better. There's a learning curve. Uh, getting you know staff to change, but I'm insistent about this. If, if there's a part or an extremity I need to see, I got to be able to see it. So don't make me go through the work of getting them disrobed and getting them onto the bed. Uh, we'll talk briefly about what you're looking for with the inspection of the back for some of those things. Uh, we'll review some issues with palpation, uh, why range of motion is significant, but of limited help for the acute evaluation, and we'll talk about specifically about provocative tests as we get into the exam here. When does this thing end, anyway? Oh, phew, I can slow down. All right, so again, we go back to our exam basics. We need to be able to see the patient's backside. Uh, and uh, you know, one of the things you can notice that may have been missed over time is does the patient have scoliosis? A lot of us can just, with uh, looking at the patient, tell is there a shift in their shoulder blades? Uh, is there a shift in the, uh, the crease above the sacral crests? Uh, when they bend forward, does one side hump up more than the other if there's rotational scoliosis? You know, that simple 10 seconds might already uh, lead you down a pathway that's going to help that patient out that may have been missed if somebody never took their shirt off and looked. Um, Milt gives me a hard time. My dad's a physician over in Marshalltown who needs to retire because he tells too many jokes about me. But I did this huge back pain workup on this nice patient about three years ago. And I could not figure out what was going on with this gal. And he walked in the room and within 30 seconds, rolled her to the side, looked at her back, and she had shingles. And I missed it because I just had not uh, taken the time to turn her to the side and actually look at her back. So, you know, my, my case example, I'd say learn from, from my uh, issue there. Uh, this lady's diagnosis and time in the ER was delayed an hour and a half, and she got x-rays she didn't need it just because we hadn't taken the time to do that. So shingles is a great example of something that can cause pain, of course, anywhere, uh, and you don't want to forget that uh, as a possible presenting factor. The other thing you're looking for is if there's any mechanism of trauma. Uh, you know, do they have bruising back there? Can you see any abrasions or discoloration? I think those are significant to flavoring how you're going to form in your mind the differential diagnosis and then your subsequent exam. Uh, next, uh, when you palpate the spine, uh, there's some, um, of course, great uh, anecdotal evidence that patients with tumors in the spine and spinal fractures have pain over the spinous processes. Uh, and uh, so to document that there's no pain to light palpation or even a, a, a fist pound over the uh, spinous processes is helpful and significant, but not necessarily diagnostic of anything. Paraspinal muscle tenderness is extremely common in a great majority of these forms of back pain. Uh, 
And so it's not diagnostic, but the absence of that. So in other words, if you palpate somebody's back and you push on the paraspinal muscles, you do a fist pound, and you're not reproducing any discomfort for them, you, know, you sort of have to, at least in your imagination, take off the table that this is a simple muscle spasm or a garden variety sprain and start to entertain some other things. <clears throat> it still might be that, but the absence of that, I think, is more significant than the positive finding here. And you need to document that in your note. Uh, flank tenderness often occurs uh, with renal pathology, as we know, but can occur with low rib fractures if somebody's had a trauma um, and uh, pyelonephritis. And so palpation is you know, still uh, a val valid and valuable part of our exam. Range of motion as a provocative factor is maybe slightly helpful. Uh, you're looking at a guy who's got congenital spondylolisthesis at L5-S1. I'm sure I'll be visiting uh, our partners, Casper or Brandenburg, in the near future, in the next decade, if I'm lucky. Um, but I would acknowledge that forward flexion uh, gets that to go away. So people are always giggling at me in the ER because I'm doing hokey things to stretch out my gluteal muscles and my hamstrings and bend forward because that's how I get relief of my discomfort when it's bothering me at the end of a 12-hour shift. Another great example of that is if somebody has had herniation of the nucleus pulposus, forward flexion tends to alleviate that discomfort. Extension might aggravate it. So range of motion might, you know, flavor a little bit of your differential diagnosis in that regard. Um, but overall, when you're looking at diagnostic uh, help, I think range of motion is more helpful with gauging how is this patient's progress from uh, day one when you're first evaluating them to maybe the second or third clinic visit. You know, it's a, probably a, a better help for you to gauge improvement in their exam or a lack thereof and then might steer you to get other studies if you find that your initial measures are failing and their range of motion is still grossly limited, they're not getting improvement. So I, I find it to be more helpful as a diagnostic clue over time than as an acute diagnostic clue to what they're actually dealing with. <clears throat> we'll talk about some provocative tests next. Uh, the heel-toe walk on the squat rise, you know, we're basically just talking about a heel-toe walk and the ability of the patient to squat down and rise. Most of that is just impossible if they've got a devastating, um, dangerous, uh, neurological problem like, say, cauda equina syndrome. Um, but much of that is still possible with some of the other things that we've talked about. Uh, but the ability to do that <clears throat> sort of uh, takes off the table in the immediate need for a neurosurgery referral. And in my world, of course, that, you know, that's the world we're operating in is which of these patients do I need to call a consultant on and which ones can I stabilize and, and get a treatment plan for. Um, so, you know, the ability to do that, it didn't take me but 10 seconds to do that, uh, is easy to document and I think says a lot. Uh, patients often will give you great resistance uh, if their back is hurting uh, to doing these things, but with a little coaching and telling them why I think, you know, I need to know how you can do, uh, most of them will get this done. I think the elderly population is different. A lot of those folks deal with other uh, disabilities, maybe bad hips, bad knees, uh, stroke symptoms, and so they may not be able to complete this portion of the exam, but for the younger uh, clientele, meaning I'm going to say 60 and under, uh, a lot of them can carry this out with re within reasonable uh, ability. And when they can't, uh, you know, it might raise your suspicion to think of some of the more uh, severe findings of low back pain. We're all familiar with the straight leg test. Uh, we learned it in med school, and we'll review that here. Uh, there's a flip test, which is a less specific version of that. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. You know, basically, the straight leg test, you've got to get the patient laying down flat. Many patients who come in with acute low back pain, particularly to spasm, don't want to do that. But I think this is an important test to rule out uh, ridiculous symptoms down the leg because what you're doing is effectively stretching the sciatic nerve. Uh, so any pain uh, below 60 degrees uh, is considered a positive test. And, uh, you know, what's uh, probably helpful to me is to really coach the patient ahead of time and say, you know, I'm going to be stretching out some muscle fibers here. I need to know if you have pain traveling from your back, any burning or or stinging, I don't really want to know about tight muscles. And so I'll often move the good leg first uh, if I'm suspicious of, for instance, sciatica symptoms, so that they kind of know what does the normal side feel like. And then, I'll, you know, if they're having sciatica symptoms, then save the, the affected side for later. That's just my reference to let the patient know kind of how to compare their own normal, so to speak. Um, if you uh, give some extra tension to the sciatic nerve by palpating the popliteal space or stretching the heel back, that can, and that's called Le Sieg sign, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, that can aggravate the symptoms as well, but it doesn't necessarily make it a more positive test. 
Uh, here's a, a diagram, and in the background, you can see the, the doctor or the physician is uh, stretching the, uh, the, uh, the sciatic nerve more by dorsiflexing the foot. Uh, there's also uh, what's called a crossed leg, straight leg test, where if I had uh, classic sciatica symptoms going down the right side and a positive test there, the crossed leg test would also cause my, provoke my symptoms on the right just by raising the left. Um, and that's supposed to have even a, a higher sensitivity. But overall, you can see, I think the key thing is the specificity of this is pretty low. Um, so there are other people that will not have sciatic disease that still give you a positive straight leg test. I think it's a good test because we, you know, it's, it's an old standard. Uh, when it's a negative test, I think that's significant and probably helpful. When it's a positive test, it doesn't necessarily nail down the diagnosis, but uh, may point you, you know, in, in that direction and certainly keeps um, nerve impingement pathology, whether that's coming from the disc or the piriformis area, keeps that in your mind anyhow. Um, the flip test is a, a less specific, specific version, uh, and that's where, uh, as you can see in the diagram, as you straighten the leg, the patient's uh, uh, forced to flip back and, and basically take the tension off the sciatic nerve uh, or, or stays, uh, you know, stop it, stop it, stop it, I can't handle that anymore because you're stretching out and causing the pain. Um, again, can be positive uh, with sciatic symptoms but uh, is uh, not as specific uh, of a test and is only useful for patients who have, a, in general, a positive straight leg test at less than 45 degrees. So patients can have a negative flip test but a positive straight leg. I don't think it's imperative that you document the flip test, but sometimes you have patients who just aren't able to lay flat for a variety of other medical reasons, particularly the elderly, and this may be the best you can do. But I think it's important that we use the right taxonomy. If you're doing the straight leg test, call it a straight leg test. If they're really seated and seated, that's not a true straight leg test, and I guess I'd say let's clear up our documentation and say we're doing a flip test, uh, so we're, uh, or a seated straight leg test might be a better way to say it so people know what you're talking about. Okay, uh, we'll keep going, talking about the neurological portion of the exam. Uh, reflexes are helpful in identifying the level of spinal cord injury. Uh, unfortunately, they can be transiently altered or abnormal uh, during the acute phase, and so they're not uh, necessarily diagnostic. Uh, they can be reversible, and uh, there are a lot of patients who just have trouble relaxing enough to provoke uh, a reflex. One great trick, as you, of course, recall, is to have them close their eyes and, and you say, uh, you're going to do it, have them pull on their own hands so that they're focused on their hands and maybe their legs are more relaxed. Sometimes you'll get a better, um, more accurate Achilles and uh, patellar reflex when you're doing that. Um, reflexes are helpful. Uh, I don't want to discourage those, but I don't think they'll make your diagnosis for some of the things that we're talking about. A um, uh, nice thing to document in your note is can they dorsiflex the toe and the foot? The maintenance of that suggests the maintenance of the L4-5 uh, region, which is uh, um, a good number of our patients who have disc bulges and neurological surgeries tend to have them down at the L4-5 S1 area. And uh, maintenance of that neuromotor system is nicely documented by a strong upward toe ability and dorsiflexion of the foot. Uh, and uh, also then documentation, if you're more concerned about things like cauda equina syndrome, we referenced this earlier, documentation of a normal anal wink, sphincter tone and the absence of saddle anesthesia. So in other words, they can feel light touch around the anus, uh, uh, I think is a, a easy thing to do and uh, easy to document. Um, if we're uh, looking at other radicular signs and you wanna see where the nerve roots are, that goes back to about our fifth slide when we had the dermatomal picture, you can sometimes delineate which nerve root just by their absence of soft touch. Uh, patients with significant nerve dysfunction, like say a bad disc bulge causing impingement on the sciatic nerve, not only will have pain, but will typically have loss of soft touch sensation or a diminished sense compared to the other side. Uh, the medial foot would evidence maybe an L4 area, dorsal foot L5, and around the uh, lateral foot and lateral malleolus, you're looking at, at around closer to S1. Um, so in summary, uh, to put all that together, yeah, we can make it pretty simple. Make sure you get your vitals on the chart with the blood pressure and pay attention to your fever. Your patients with a fever might gear you to go in a different direction. Make sure you get these people disrobed and look at their back. Um, you know, somebody's going to make the day of some young 20-year-old who's been wondering why they have back pain because nobody's ever looked at his or her back without a shirt on to see they have scoliosis or maybe uh, you'll be uh, guilty of the Van Gundy phenomenon and find shingles as a cause of low back pain. Um, 
Uh, I think palpation and documenting that is important. It shows that you've touched the patient. Uh, probably the more key thing there is when you thoroughly palpate the back and try and provoke pain, if, the, if you do not provoke it, that might you know, trigger you to go on to your more complex differential diagnosis of things that are more dangerous as a cause of acute low back pain. Can they do the heel, toe, and squat test? That takes 10 seconds in the office, and that's all you have to say on your note. Patient adequately can do heel, toe, and squat rise with no difficulty, uh, no foot drop, no weakness. I mean, that's a pretty easy thing to document. Straight leg test, I think, is helpful. It's, a, you know, it's an old standard. Uh, again, it's got a low specificity, so don't uh, let that necessarily funnel or tunnel your diagnosis, but it is helpful. Make sure if you're doing the flip test or the seated test that that's the diagnosis that you document in your chart. And then reflexes and sensory testing, probably of those two, the sensory testing, I think, for our purposes in the acute setting uh, is a more significant part of your exam. Uh, but more than all of that, I think continuity of care is where the strength of following the course of these uh, presentations really comes into play. Uh, a lot of these patients who present with acute low back pain may not initially have neurologically threatening injuries, but may evolve trouble over time. And your ability to follow that as the family physician or the internist or the primary care provider is really key. And so referring, thankfully, back to records in EPIC, uh, or following, for instance, their uh, status through a uh, round of physical therapy is significant and probably just as valuable as any of these other things that we've talked about. Um, as a risk management strategy, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, patient education and, and recheck are key, I think. Uh, if we tell the patient and document, you know, I need you back here at any time if you develop foot drop, incontinence, and worse pain, and by the way, let's have a plan to recheck this in three weeks if it's not better. Uh, or I'm going to send you to physical therapy and I need to see you at the conclusion of that so we can see how you're doing. You know, putting that into your chart is a really strong risk management defense strategy, but I think it makes good common sense. You're, you're going to identify those patients who need to go on and see our, our spine and neuro specialists and tease out the ones who maybe don't. Um, and when we talk about uh, imaging of the spine, uh, the grand majority of our acute low back pain doesn't need any imaging because, again, the grand majority of these are soft tissue mechanical things that are going to resolve with conservative treatment. But if your, um, if your history would indicate a, a source of trauma uh, that might steer you that way, uh, plain films can be beneficial to rule out in particular compression fractures. Again, we think about that in our elderly who may have minimal um, uh, mechanism of injury, and we think about it in anybody who's got a significant axial load whether it's falling from a height and landing on the heels, that's a great way to get a compression fracture or landing on the buttocks. Um, keep that in mind. But if you have red flags or warning signs of more serious pathology, you really want to get away from x-ray and probably get to your CT and MR um, modalities. So what are those red flags? Uh, this is a list uh, that uh, the AARQ and other authors have referenced, and I, I think makes sense. Uh, and these don't necessarily make a diagnosis, but to have them sort of familiar and in the back of your mind, you know, will allow you to shuffle out uh, some of the more um, stable patients and shuffle in to ones that uh, you have to keep uh, a higher index of suspicion for other pathology for. So age greater than 50, significant trauma, unexplained weight loss. I mean, you can read the list here. Uh, these are all significant findings that uh, might be red flags and might indicate a need for you to have to look further. But on that slide that we just had, how many of those things were exam findings? Because I think doctors are so, you know, we're so uh, objective. Uh, what's the objective exam? What's the test? What's the lab result? Well, uh, of that list, only two, two of those things were exam findings. Everything else of those high risk things go back to our history. And so I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but uh, 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 documenting the history and what the patient is saying, you know, is going to identify a great number of these uh, red flag markers. And it's nice to just see that reminder, I think. Um, family practice trained, and so I still rely on the American Academy of Family Practice, and they use uh, sort recommendations for practice. We're going to review those really quick. These are going to summarize some of the topics we've already sort of, or things we've been talking about. So, and red flags are common, um, but they don't necessarily make the diagnosis for anything. Uh, and you should keep uh, those patients in mind that uh, you need to have a higher index of suspicion for pathology. Um, but overall, they don't make the diagnosis, and what's probably more helpful is a comprehensive approach, your ability to follow these patients over time, your ability to document an improvement or a deterioration in their objective exam uh, is, is more helpful than any one of these tests or these red flag criteria that we're talking about. Um, when it comes to imaging, uh, without findings of serious pathology or mechanism of injury, 
the great majority of simple acute low back pain really doesn't need this at the first um, evaluation because, again, most of those are ligament uh, strains and inflammation and soft tissue that are going to get better with uh, conservative things like uh, NSAIDs and education. And that brings us up to the next point. Patient education, including moving, uh, is valuable. Uh, it does seem to show that there's a beneficial nature of this interaction between the physician and the patient. If you give them the expectation that this should get better and here's what you need to do to accomplish that goal, um, I think that's a valuable endeavor. Uh, physical therapy, I, I like physical therapy out of the ER because I don't have the luxury of continuity of care. Um, if I think uh, it's uh, uh, something that's um, needs to go there, I'll direct the patient to go for two or three weeks and, by the way, call tomorrow to set up a recheck with your doctor in two or three weeks. I like the objective nature of PT. Uh, I also like it for workers' comp related issues because they do a very nice job nowadays of objectifying what the patient's capacity is, um, putting in objective terms their range of motion and whether that's improved or declined with their modalities. And if it hasn't, then the physician who sees them at follow-up maybe has a little more meat on the bone to say, gosh, I need to go uh, think about doing an MRI or getting the secondary consultant to see this uh, patient who's not getting better. Um, not trying to take sides or divide the uh, community, uh, but spinal manipulation and chiropractic techniques aren't really proven scientifically to offer any improvement in any of the modalities that we've already talked about for the routine management of acute low back pain. But NSAIDs, Tylenol, and muscle relaxants are effective treatments for nonspecific acute low back pain. And my little pearl or my little uh, soapbox, if you will, is uh, as you know, um, we're facing an epidemic of narcotic addiction uh, with prescription drugs all over. Central Iowa is certainly no exception to that, and the ER is no exception to that. I don't know what Mary Greeley's policy is now. Marshalltown has a no-narcotic policy that identifies patients who come in for frequent visits of chronic pain. So we'll, you come in with a kidney stone, I'm going to treat you like I would everybody else, but you come in with acute low back pain, and by the way, we look back and you've had eight visits this year and you're already on MS Cotton twice a day, and it's typically for headache, fibromyalgia, shoulder pain, back pain, we're not going to treat that acute back pain with uh, narcotics. We're going to refer that patient back to their primary care provider. And I think it's okay to have an open dialogue about that. Um, and so that brings us to our next slide here when we're talking about <clears throat> um, being aware of what might be some non-organic factors of back pain. I think while certainly there's the rare patient who's seeking financial compensation or litigation, I think the, by and large the largest group of patients that I see in the ER that are fictitious really pertain more to uh, looking for narcotics. And uh, um, uh, they often will describe pain in a distribution which is non-anatomic. Uh, some other possible warning signs will be pain that's out of proportion to exam or maybe a patient was able to get out of the car, walk into the parking lot, sit in the lobby, walk back to the room, but now they seem completely unable to extend their knee or dorsiflex their foot. So these contradictory uh, findings uh, are significant um, and, uh, uh, you know, a non-dermatomal loss for sensory pain. But overall, I think having a comprehensive ability to look at the patient is what's going to be what safely identifies uh, these folks. Um, you know, getting them back for continuity of care, rechecking them, following their course over time. Um, those are going to be the way where you start to identify those patients that uh, are factitious in nature, as well as the uh, um, patients who are just acute low back pain of a garden variety etiology that's going to resolve without the need for further uh, intervention. Um, one last thing I wanted to put a pearl in with that. Uh, many people are familiar with the pmp.iowa.gov. Uh, website. It's a free uh, service through the uh, Physician Monitoring Program through the Pharmacy Board of Iowa. Uh, if you uh, log on to that website, there'll be a place where you click and you can enter your physician name, your DEA number, and your personal email. Within about three days, you'll get a password, and it's a very easy site to use. And what it allows you to do is go back and look, and any patient who's filled a prescription, I think it goes back five years, uh, for any benzodiazepine or narcotic will show up on that. So if you're needing some help to ferret out that troublesome patient, uh, you're worried that their doctor shopping for narcotics, it's a fantastic free website. It's uh, information that's uh, provided uh, you know, through uh, the pharmacy board that's uh, through the state of Iowa at no cost to you, and it's a great way to get accurate information. The only thing you have to keep in mind is it's only up to date from about two weeks ago. So if somebody's been on a string of ERs or a string of clinics in the last week, it may not show up on that website. Also, uh, Tramadol and Ultram, for some reason, don't show up on that website. 
Okay, we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, I'm going to go just through two quick case examples because I thought these were interesting and they sort of put a, a face to the name of all these things that we're talking about. These were cases that were just recently managed uh, through our clinic uh, on the Marshalltown side. Uh, this 40-year-old uh, is actually an athletic male um, and uh, didn't, couldn't think of any trauma, but he came into Friday afternoon clinic with a two-week history of lumbar pain. Um, it was slowly getting worse and it did radiate with a sciatic distribution. Uh, with occasional numbness down the uh, uh, thigh. Uh, he did not have any incontinence, fever, or other joint pains. All these things were very nicely documented in the family physician's note. Uh, normal vital signs, including an absence of a fever, were documented. Uh, a good palpation and inspection exam were, palp were documented. Uh, the patient had a positive straight leg test, and the reflexes were normal. No big toe weakness was documented, and uh, the muscle strength looks fine. Those, those were all quotes from the record. Uh, the patient was given a shot of Toradol and Apresin and Flexeril and a, a plan to uh, have a dedicated recheck in two or three weeks, if not getting better or at any time, uh, if uh, uh, failing therapy. And at that time, the doctor even put in the note, uh, would consider further imaging or physical therapy. I thought overall the note was actually very good. Uh, I thought it, it uh, was a good uh, note. Uh, it could be slightly improved upon. There wasn't a clear sensory exam, and maybe somebody could nitpick about the exact nature of the motor testing, but I, I thought it really hit the uh, high points of some of the things that we've talked about. Unfortunately, the fellow didn't get any relief and he came to see us in the ER that same evening. Uh, the Toradol hadn't really helped. Uh, the numbness was worsening down the legs and his gait had become somewhat weak or unstable and it was really hard to tell if that was due to muscle weakness or if he was just so inhibited by his pain that he, he just couldn't uh, you know, marshal enough momentum to cooperate with the exam. Uh, the identical history was repeated again with the absence of any incontinence to urine or stool. Uh, he didn't have any saddle anesthesia. Uh, in the ER, his vital signs remained stable and he was afebrile, but his gait was definitely antalgic but without foot drop. Uh, he had similar back exam, almost identical exam was documented, except that now formal strength testing in the ER revealed a distinct weakness in the left compared to the right and a notable numbness in the bilateral sciatic nerve distribution which the, uh, was drawn, a, a picture was drawn that uh, showed the posterior legs down to uh, the thighs down to about the knees of both legs. So it was enough that uh, we don't typically order MRIs out of the ER and this is not my patient's uh, uh, MRI. We got through our new PAC system. I just could not copy the films but I'm going to ask you to trust me and say it looked just like this one. Uh, this is a picture from the internet, and uh, you can see here where the red arrow is. This, fellow, this patient has a disc bulge, and so did our patient. Uh, on MRI, had a severe disc bulge. Uh, those were words used by the radiologist. Uh, herniation at L5-S1 with nerve root compression, left greater than right, which was commensurate with all the exam findings. So IV pain medicines were given, solumedrol, and a plan uh, with some steroids, and a uh, plan to see a uh, regular doctor back in three days. Uh, well, the patient... Um, uh, it was a nice fellow. He said, I, I didn't feel like any of those things helped, so I didn't bother filling them. The Dilaudid didn't help. Uh, my symptoms just got worse. Uh, so I don't really look at him as being noncompliant. I think he uh, just had such severe pain. He didn't want to move, and he was hoping it would settle down, and maybe the IV medicines would kick in. But finally, he returned back to the ER almost 24 hours later, now having urinary overflow incontinence, uh, and worse numbness going down uh, to the mid-calf region of both legs, worse pain. And so he was sent to Des Moines, and uh, subsequently had emergency decompression surgery and had to have a second surgery for a different reason, but has done really well. Um, but probably if we were going to look back at this case, I, I always think there's a little bit to learn. Uh, in hindsight, it's 2020, and, and uh, our clinic note I thought was adequate. I thought it could have been a little better uh, in terms of medical legal risk if we would have done a, a sensory exam. I thought it could have been a, a little better if we would have had a formal description of what the strength testing was, and that can also be said of the provider in the ER. Um, one interesting thing is this is a fellow who only came in for well checks once every 18 months, uh, uh, never came in seeking pain medicine, so there was no reason to believe he was factitious in nature. Um, and probably out of the ER, my opinion is that our PA should have called a, a neuro or spine consultant that first night when the MRI was obtained and that was not done. I think if you have those kind of distinct symptoms with uh, uh, obvious MRI changes, put in the call that day. Uh, to get a, a formal plan. Uh, if, the, if the specialist says, you see him back in three days and let me know, then document that on your note. If the specialist says, oh yeah, I'll clear out 
you know, 20 minutes in my afternoon, send them down to me tomorrow morning or send them right away, you put that in your note. <clears throat> but I think if you have uh, distinct neurological findings and an abnormal MRI, that merits a phone call to that provider. Uh, another case uh, was a gentleman uh, who's seen uh, family practice in Marshalltown for a long time, 74-year-old male on Enbrel for psoriasis. He's had a pacemaker, history of type 2 diabetes, uh, and he, he presented with this really weird presentation of illness that the initial provider, I think, thought was more of a pneumonia workup because he had periscapular pleuritic pain that was worse than you would take a, a big breath. He had a terrible flare of his psoriasis on his abdomen and flank. He also had a facial cellulitis that was really pronounced. Uh, his temp was 102.3, yet uh, his, his uh, x-ray, his CBC, his basic metabolic panel, his D-dimer, all that stuff was fine, but his sed rate was 80. I think the provider thought, well, I, I have a pretty good reason to explain a sed rate of 80 in a 74-year-old with all these things going on. Um, so uh, he, a pretty thorough exam was documented. At this time, uh, the presentation of back pain wasn't really rising to the top of the patient's main three or four complaints. And so uh, a, a dedicated neuromotor exam wasn't carried out, but I, I think I understand why. Um, and so what was documented was he moves all four extremities with a symmetrical smile and clear speech. and you know, I, I don't think it's imperative that we do a neurosensory motor exam on a patient who comes in with pneumonia and facial cellulitis, but uh, this patient be, gets to be interesting as time goes on. We had a blood culture. He's put on Lebequin, Tylenol. Uh, Valium seemed to resolve his uh, periscapular discomfort, and there was a dedicated follow-up with the family doc in two or three days. Uh, he still had the facial cellulitis, but things were slightly improved. Uh, he still had the weird left periscapular uh, pain, but maybe slightly better. His temp was coming down. The labs continued to be normal, but now the sed rate was up to 105. Uh, but otherwise, the exam was really not much changed. Family doc, to his credit, did a great job of having dedicated follow-up with this patient. And so I'm now six days after the initial ER presentation. At that time, the fever was gone, but by this uh, point in time, his blood culture had grown out strep beard ends. And uh, the guy was really still complaining of what looked like something pleuritic in the chest. So initially, a uh, chest CT angiogram was done to rule out maybe an atypical PE. I mean, that's how evasive this uh, presentation was. Um, he had no fever, but he continued to have left mid thoracic back pain. The, the PE ang uh, C CT angiogram of the chest was normal. We're two weeks later now for a recheck. He's, uh, he's off the Levaquin. His labs are normal. The CRP's improved. But now, for the first time, the guy says, this nagging pain that's been in my mid to low back uh, that I just has never gone away. And so uh, an abdominal CT was carried out to look for weird things like maybe an aneurysm uh, and showed uh, uh, perivertebral edema uh, consistent with discitis. And the patient went on to eventually have that demonstrated not only on his CT but on a, uh, a gallium nuclear medicine scan. So he was placed on IV Vanco. The reason I thought that case was interesting it was, it was such a delayed, evolving presentation of discitis for a guy who came in with four or five other complaints. But clearly, when you look back, if we think about, uh, I love this slide. It was really where the droids you were looking for. Uh, if we look back at this guy, um, you know, he, uh, he clearly was immune compromised. He had some other disease processes going on. He was on Enbrel for psoriasis. Uh, and um, yet, even with the uh, active discitis, uh, his fever was gone and his CRP was improving on the PO Levaquin. So, it's a hard diagnosis to make unless you sort of throw it up into the, um, you know, I always think of uh, having some of your garden variety differential diagnoses down here and then the more complex ones up here. And unless you uh, think that this is a fellow who's got a reason to have uh, other pathology, you know, the family doc may not have picked up on that. Looking back, though, probably the thing that was that doctor's greatest strength was having dedicated rechecks of this fellow over time and that continuity of care, you know, you just can't under understate the value of that. Um, so, in summary, uh, I think a review of these cases shows there's value to having a comprehensive approach. Uh, you want to always rely on your historical elements. Uh, most of those red flag factors are not going to show up on your exam, but are rather going to be proven out in your history. Uh, document a clear exam. Let's not be goofing up our flip test and our straight leg tests. Let's have some clear documentation about where they have loss of soft touch, uh, what is their specific motor strength and follow-up reassessment for concerning cases or cases that uh, rise to uh, a level of higher suspicion is really key. And you always want to document all that. That's all I have, folks. Um, any questions? I guess I'm supposed to take questions. And if not, that's okay. 
All right. I appreciate your time, and uh, it's been a pleasure to come talk with you. Thanks. Okay, is that kind of what you're looking for? Or? I've never seen these, so. Yeah. It is nice to see people. I know Selden, and I, I know the folks that come over and do outreach stuff. Um, so. Is that kind of what they're looking for? Or? Okay. <laughs> well, good. Thanks, Steve. It was, I mean, it was a pleasure. So. Uh, you know, I do a ton of uh, ER, EMS, uh, PowerPoints uh, four times a year, but that's to a paramedic, EMT, ER, nurse community. So I, I got a little more nervous about this one when it's a community of your peers. But, uh, but yeah, you know, if somebody has something else, and they so I can turn that off. They, uh,